Daily Minutes number 1594 with the broadcast of today, 14 April 2019. This is our Bulletin of Sunday. This bulletin will be completely in English. Today we have the ARRL audio news. And after that we have Ono VK6 FLAB with his Foundations column. After that we have another ARRL publication, The Doctor is In. Today's topic is Receiving Outside the Amateur Bands. This is ARRL Audio News, your weekly summary of news highlights from the world of amateur radio. If you retransmit audio news through a repeater, listen for the Morse code K character, followed by four seconds of silence. That's your cue to stop transmitting so that your repeater timer can reset. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, and I have a note for our listeners. ARRL Audio News will not be distributed next Friday, April 19th, as ARRL headquarters will be closed for Good Friday. And now our stories for Friday, April 12th. Scientists charged with predicting the sun's activity for cycle 25 say it's likely to be much like that of the current cycle 24, which is declining and predicted to bottom out in 2019 or 2020. The Solar Cycle 25 prediction panel experts said cycle 25 may get off to a slow start, but is anticipated to peak between 2023 and 2026 with a sunspot range of 95 to 130. This is well below the typical average of 140 to 220 sunspots per solar cycle. The panel expressed high confidence that the coming cycle should break the trend of weakening solar activity seen over the past four cycles. The Solar Cycle Prediction Panel forecasts the number of sunspots expected for solar maximum, along with the timing of the peak and minimum solar activity levels for the cycle. The outlook was presented on April 5th at the 2019 NOAA Space Weather Workshop in Boulder, Colorado. The Solar Cycle Prediction gives a rough idea of the frequency of space weather storms of all types, from radio blackouts to geomagnetic storms and solar radiation storms. In addition to its effect on amateur radio signal propagation, space weather can affect power grids, critical military, airline, and shipping communications, satellites and GPS signals, and can even threaten astronauts through exposure to harmful radiation. Solar Cycle 24 reached its maximum in April 2014 with a peak average of 82 sunspots. The sun's northern hemisphere led the sunspot cycle, peaking more than two years ahead of the southern hemisphere sunspot peak. Given that the sun takes 11 years to complete one solar cycle, this is only the fourth time that U.S. scientists have issued a solar cycle prediction. The first panel convened in 1989 for Cycle 22. For Solar Cycle 25, the panel hopes for the first time to predict the presence, amplitude, and timing of any differences between the northern and southern hemispheres on the Sun, known as hemispheric asymmetry. The winning article for the April 2019 QST Cover Plaque Award is a high-power 160 and 80-meter transmitting loop antenna by Steve Adler, VK5SFA. The antenna design won first place in the 2018 QST Antenna Design Competition. The QST Cover Plaque Award, given to the author or authors of the most popular article in each issue, is determined by a vote of ARRL members on the QST Cover Plaque Poll webpage. The Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APRS, payload on AMSAT India's AISAT-1 satellite is operational on 145.825 MHz following a successful April 1st launch. The payload was powered up on schedule over Europe, and AMSAT India announced that DK3WN was able to digipete through the satellite. AMSAT India requests that radio amateurs use the payload and SAT gates to feed the traffic. The fourth stage of the PSLV rocket will become an orbital platform in a 485-kilometer orbit hosting the APRS Digipeter, an automatic identification system from India Space Agency, and an ionospheric analyzer from the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. 
The Jersey Shore Amateur Radio Society hosted the Girl Scouts of the Jersey Shore Council in support of the 2019 Thinking Day on the Air event. The event is devoted to connecting Girl Scouts and Girl Guides around the world. The February event marked the first time either group took part. Some 50 Girl Scouts signed up to attend. Ten operators activated multiple HF, VHF, and UHF bands using CW and voice, analog, and digital modes. A surprise success was the club's Yesu Fusion repeater, which allowed a mobile fusion radio in the clubhouse to make contacts in North America and elsewhere around the world. Stations were set up by the Girl Scout Council for most of the activities to earn the ARRL radio patch and possibly inspire some interest in getting licensed. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. We have another amateur satellite that has been tested and ready for amateur use. Back on October 29, 2018, the Daiwada 2 microsatellite was launched. It was developed by PHL Microsat Program in cooperation with the University of the Philippines, Tohoku University and Hokkaido University. The satellite having been tested and operational was issued Philippines Oscar 101 or PO 101 and is available for amateur use. If you would like to use this satellite, the uplink frequency is 437.500 MHz and the downlink is 145.900 MHz. This is an FM transponder. Thanks to Drew, KO4MA, AMSAT VP of Operation, and Oscar Number Administrator for this story. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO, for the ARRL Audio News. This is the ARRL Audio News propagation forecast for Friday, April 12th. We have a strong group of spots on the surface of the sun, and they've managed to boost the solar flux index up to 80. Combined with the quiet geomagnetic conditions, the HF bands look reasonably good over the next several days. There have been reports of 15-meter DX openings and even a few long path openings as high as 12 meters. Now, these conditions won't last, so enjoy them while you can. On VHF and UHF, there have been some weak 2-meter openings in Florida and the Carolinas, but if you live in Southern California, be on alert for the potential of excellent VHF conditions over the next several days. And that concludes ARRL Audio News for this week. Our thanks to all contributors to this week's report. ARRL Audio News is produced by the American Radio Relay League, the National Association for Amateur Radio. For more information on amateur radio or the ARRL, visit us on the web at ARRL.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching for ARRL. If you have a question or comment about ARRL Audio News, email us at audionews at ARRL.org. This program is copyright ARRL, all rights reserved. 73, and thanks for listening. Foundations of Amateur Radio Our day-to-day -day life is full of communication. We listen, although less and less, to the radio for news and entertainment, sometimes mixed together as food and games for the masses. We can communicate with family, friends and the rest of the global population using a telephone. With the internet as a transmission medium, we exchange text, sound and vision with impunity to anyone who stumbles across it on a mind-boggling collection of outlets, websites, social media, email, streaming services, to name a few. The vast majority of this kind of communication is a commodity. That means that with little or no training, most of the population has access to this. Another aspect of this commodification is that it's reliable. It works most of the time. It's generally good quality with little or no loss, as in you speak into your phone and there's an extremely high chance for the other party to hear your voice. While there are occasions that calls drop out or the audio is chopped up, it's more an exception rather than a regular occurrence. In stark contrast, amateur radio is none of those things. It's not a commodity, it's not reliable, it's a poor man's version of the ubiquitous mobile phone. As amateurs, we know why it's not the same. For starters, to make a contact between, say, Perth and Bermuda using amateur radio requires exactly two pieces of equipment, your radio and theirs. Making this contact with a mobile requires that both ends have a phone. They'll also need a way to connect to the phone network, 
either a local base station or a telephone exchange. Those in turn connect via many different ways to each other, including repeaters, relays, perhaps a satellite, a fibre optic cable or three, too many devices to count today. Extreme level of complexity. I'm mentioning this because it's simple to conclude that amateur radio is obsolete, but it's just not true. With a lack of reliability associated with an amateur radio connection comes something that is unique to society today. Thanks to reliable communication, we have come to expect that all communication is reliable, even our experimental hobby. But if you spend any time on air at all, you'll quickly realise that for amateur radio, we need to conduct ourselves with protocol, using specific procedures, phonetics, structured phrases, call signs and the like, to overcome some of the aspects of unreliability. Talking on the local repeater looks and smells like a mobile phone chat room, but it's not. It relies entirely on the participants collaborating to ensure reliable communication. Similarly, calling CQ on HF requires that you understand that the other station isn't on the end of a telephone connection and that parts of what you're saying are going to be missing at the other end. Using phonetics, speaking slower, waiting longer and monitoring all assist with making contact. If you're unsure about this, just listen in on a local net for regular confusion. Or use an online receiver like WebSDR to hear what you sound like at the other end. To make things a little more interesting, every amateur band has a different failure mode. On 20 metres from one breath to the next, the path might close. On 80 metres, you might get overwhelmed by noise. On 40 metres, you might find yourself all of a sudden sharing the frequency with another station both of you blissfully unaware of the other's existence. Communication in amateur radio is collaborative, and there are common courtesy behaviours. If you're working a rare DX station that's not a personal friend, don't start a whole conversation about your dogs, your medical issues, or the level of amazingness of your station. You're not alone in attempting to make the contact, and they're not there for your personal enjoyment. Hogging the frequency is a sure-fired way to acquire the ire of your fellow amateurs, especially in marginal conditions where band conditions are rapidly changing. There is nothing like getting your feet wet by actually getting on air and making noise. But when you do, remind yourself that this is not a telephone, and it's not perfect. Be mindful of your on-air conduct, and you'll find a globe full of friends. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. This is The Doctor Is In, your bi weekly podcast that discusses all things technical and not so technical. The Doctor Is In podcast is produced by ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and sponsored by DX Engineering, helping you shrink the globe. See their website at www.dxengineering.com. And now, here's your host, QST editor Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and the doctor himself, Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Hello and welcome to The Doctor Is In. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY. And I'm Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Welcome back, Joel. It's been, what, three months? I don't know what it is. It's been a long time. It, and it feels really good to be back, and I want to uh, say thanks to all the people who have expressed concern about my well-being, and I have been on medical leave. I Actually, at the beginning, I not only was on medical leave, but I was hoarse, so I couldn't even talk if I wanted to. <laughs> but um, we discussed doing it on CW, but decided that wouldn't yeah, that, that would be a little problematic, yes. Yeah. So um, I'm hopefully going to be able to continue doing this for a while, and, and we'll see how it goes. We'll, one month at a time or something. Yeah. And uh, here we are. I'm sure they're tired of just hearing from me, so... <laughs> you're... Well, they'll get tired of me pretty soon, too. <laughs> well, for our topic here today, you you picked a good one because it's something that applies to pretty much every amateur radio operator, and that is what you can listen to outside of the frequencies that you might normally operate. 
Absolutely. And that's the way a lot of people started out. I did, certainly. Me too. And uh, back in, in the early days, um, somebody might have given you a, um, a shortwave receiver as a present. You started tuning around listening to things. And, of course, you heard Radio Moscow came in 40 over 9 on oh, yeah. 15 different frequencies. HCJB. That was one oh, of the yeah. first I ever heard, really. And uh, all over, you could listen to things. We could listen to the Voice of America and find out what uh, they wanted people to think was happening here. And we could listen to Radio Moscow and find out what they wanted us to think was happening over there and all that kind of stuff. But occasionally we'd run across an amateur station operating on AM because that's pretty much what our receivers could pick up. Now, for me, I just heard single sideband. I heard uh-huh. a lot of... And I wondered what it was. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I yeah. guess when I started, it was pretty much AM was, was what was happening. Mm-hmm. And that worked much better with those receivers. Yes. And in fact, I should mention that um, almost all, not all, but but most ham transceivers have a very capable general coverage receiver. So you can still do that today on your ham transceiver. Oh, absolutely. And it makes a much better receiver than the ones we struggled with in the 50s and 60s or yes. whatever. Now, the days of shortwave broadcasting are largely behind us, unfortunately. Although, I mean, there are still some there are shortwave broadcasters, some English-language broadcasters are still out there. Radio Romania is still there. Radio China is still there. Yep. Uh, and they're broadcasting in English. And I think Vatican Radio and the BBC, to a certain extent, been, are, they, are still they've there. They've all been cutting back pretty much. And, and what they've been doing is going to Internet broadcasting and also, yes. in some of the cases, um, digitally encoded shortwave. So they're on shortwave but you can't hear them on your radio unless you have the proper software to be able to decode them. So a lot of people are, are listening to other things besides shortwave broadcasts, and that's yes. what we'll talk about in a minute. But the other thing is the AM amateur operators are still out there too. There aren't as many of them, but there are usually some hams on 75 or 80 meters and 40 meters that you can hear on AM if your receiver only does AM. Yeah, on 40 meters, I hear them up around uh, 7290. Yep, up there and, and 3885 on, on um, 80 meters. And interestingly, W1AW has added voice bulletins on 7290 yes. on AM, which is very nice. So, so you can still hear amateur communications on uh, your shortwave receiver even if you don't receive single sideband. And once you tune outside the amateur bands, there is a lot out there to be heard. I mean, beyond shortwave broadcasting, yep. um, there is even, and I rolled into this the other day, it's aircraft communication, but it's HF aircraft right. communication. Living here on the East Coast of the United States, we have the luxury of being able to hear the planes as they take off from, uh, say, New York Kennedy, and they're headed out over the ocean, and they will check in on certain HF frequencies, and uh, you can you can hear them. Nearby the airport, you can often hear the aircraft on VHF. Yes. 121.5 and around there. But for longer ranges, they use single sideband HF, and there's a whole bunch of frequency ranges that they use, so you can definitely hear them. Now, the uh, problem with listening to aircraft is that they they talk in their own kind of code. That's true. <laughs> and it's often difficult to understand what they're talking about, but at least you can hear them. And, uh, and they also talk quickly. <laughs> Very quickly. Well, it's kind of ritualized. I'm not a pilot, but I do know that to a large extent, they know what to expect when they're talking. Now, I do monitor what you just alluded to, the VHF AM aeronautical band, which is uh, roughly, well, for voice communication, roughly 118 megahertz up to, uh, what is it, uh, 130 something, I think? Something like that. Something like that. And I enjoy listening, (laughs) strange as this makes out, during bad weather, because that's when you hear some particularly curious conversation, (laughs) let's put it that way. Yeah. Not, nothing dramatic usually, although I have heard a few of those, but uh, normally just listening to the airline pilots as they're approaching, in our case, Bradley International Airport, and listening to them dealing with high winds or heavy precipitation or, or what have you. Indeed. And similarly, uh, another category of station is the maritime uh, uh, station. Yes. And, and it's very similar in the sense that they use... Um, VHF, not AM in that case, FM in the 156 to 162 megahertz range. And that's used for coastal traffic and uh, within harbors and so forth. So if you're near the coast, you can hear that. They also have HF high seas channels and they're spread throughout the spectrum, just like amateur radio to take advantage of the propagation and the uh, aircraft radios as well. So there are um, ranges at 4, 6, 8, 12, 16, 18, 22, and 25 megahertz where people can actually 
communicate on HF from boats, and that's not just uh, that's pleasure boats as well as commercial traffic. Much of the commercial traffic has gone to Inmarsat satellite communication. So unless you have uh, equipment prepared to deal with that, you can't hear that. But the uh, most pleasure boats operate on HF when they're offshore. Now, you're a boater. I know that. And if you're in shore, close to shore, are you using VHF, radio yes. communication? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And as opposed to just your cell phone? It depends. Some of the people I talk to use cell phones and some of the people <laughs> use radio. <laughs> it's a little more convenient. I'm not a great cell phone fan. So I do have um, VHF FM marine radio on board and I have a, a separate remote microphone in the cockpit. So while I'm sailing the boat, I can communicate with that. What I do is a lot of group kind of stuff with a um, club I'm part of. We go out to lunch on Wednesdays and uh, we meet up and, and so forth. So it's very handy. I can uh, call on the radio and we can make sure we're in the same place at the same time. And we tie up for a while first for a social hour before lunch. Very decadent kind of thing. But um, <laughs> one of the advantages of being retired, I guess. I've noticed some of the marine frequencies that I see on websites like uh, radioreference.com. They'll make reference to a harbor master frequency. What is that? I'm not sure about harbor master frequency. There's a there are a couple specific channels. Channel 16, which is uh, 156.8 megahertz, is the calling the universal calling and distress frequency. So you're supposed to, if your radio is on and you're not using it, you're supposed to leave it on channel 16 so you can hear somebody calling for help. And that's what most people do. And the idea is you just like on our uh, two meter calling frequencies, you're supposed to make contact. And then unless the contact is going to last less time than it says than it takes to say, mm -hmm. please, let's shift to some other channel. Yes. You're supposed to move off that channel and do your traffic on another channel. So 156.8 is, is the popular one that everybody listens to. And then um, channel nine at 156.45 is kind of an alternate to that. And in places where there's a lot of traffic, um, they've pretty much moved the non-distress uh, calls off of 16 onto 9. So. Oh, okay. Okay. And, of course, we're talking here now about people that have uh, VHF, FM, mobile rigs, or handhelds can eavesdrop on this. Also, of course, I mean, this has been the case for decades, you can listen to police and fire communications up there right. as well. Although I know that a lot of the police communication have transitioned to digital in recent years. I know in uh, I know in my town they've gone up to 800 megahertz and they're running entirely digital now. Uh, however, my fire department is still down around 154 megahertz, and I know a lot of guys in my town that just have FM handhelds. They tune up there, and so they plug that into their memories and they monitor the local fire and ambulance dispatch. Right. And and that's true of the VHF, too. The uh, VHF marine frequencies are covered by most handheld and, and other FM amateur uh, transceivers. Aircraft AM transmit missions are covered on some, very few. Some, yeah. Very few. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, uh, you may look into that when you buy a, uh, your next FM transceiver because you can get some. I forget which brand it is, but... Uh, and maybe it's more than one brand, but but some aircraft fans or pilots um, specifically go for two meter FM transceivers that cover the one twenty megahertz yes. range with AM, and that's that can be handy. They're not the majority, but they're definitely out there. Yeah, there are some, and uh, you know it's not of high interest to me. Although I do listen to uh, marine traffic from the car if I'm uh, expecting to get to the boat and want to know what's happening out there. The other thing you can do is, of course, the marine weather is on yes. channels that are in that same range. I forget the frequencies offhand. but uh, So you can listen to weather on your 2-meter FM transceiver, which is very handy, NOAA weather. And the NOAA weather, yes. Several months ago in QST, I wrote an article, published an article, about eavesdropping on railroad communications yep. and Amtrak in particular. And that's once again something that is easily heard up around uh, 160 to roughly 163 megahertz, give or take. And that can be pretty interesting. Even if you are some distance from an Amtrak line, you can still hear freight communications or whatnot. But as you point out, they tend to speak in their own language and speak very quickly. Yeah. So you don't <laughs> you don't get a lot of information. No, no. 
And sometimes there's a lot of background noise and uh, coupled with shouts and the occasional obscenity and, yeah. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But, hey, that's that's what makes life interesting. So the, the bottom line really is if you're confining yourself just to the amateur radio bands, whether it's VHF, UHF, or HF, potentially uh, you're missing a lot, right? Yeah, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is most amateur uh, radio operation is limited to um, moderate power in, in our country is 1500 watts PEP output and so forth and most people have medium sized antennas the nice thing about listening to international short wave is you're talking you know 50,000 watts and a giant sturba curtain <laughs> pointed pointed your way and uh, lots of times that'll get through but there won't be much amateur communication around that's true. So you can get a good, strong signal. You can tune off and listen to WWB and find out whether <laughs> the bands are open, too. You know, That's you right. Calibrate your watch and, and what have you. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's take a break, listen to DX Engineering, and we shall be back. All right. Our fellow hams have told us how much they love receiving the DX Engineering catalog. It's 132 pages of amateur radio heaven, packed with competitively priced equipment. You'll find everything from multiband Yagis to whip antennas, the latest bass transceivers to mobile radios, and every accessory under the sun. But the catalog only represents a small part of what DX Engineering offers. When you visit DXEngineering.com, you'll find thousands of items from trusted names like ICOM, Yesu, Kenwood, and Alinko. There's world-famous antennas from OptiBeam, E-Antennas, and M-Squared, Roan and American Towers, plus many more. And shop a wide selection of innovative DX Engineering brand products. They're designed and manufactured by our team of amateur radio enthusiasts for hams just like you. Plus, you get the fastest shipping in the ham universe, and shipping is free on most orders over $99. Experience ham radio heaven at DXEngineering.com. That's DXEngineering.com. And we're back, Joel. And Paul, KN4CHK, is asking, There are many features available and equipment that a new amateur can purchase. When looking for a new or used HF transceiver, what features are a must-have? What features are nice to have? And what features are really not necessary? Wow. Yeah, uh, that's, that's <laughs> a, I, I get a lot of questions along that line, and it's, it's really kind of hard to answer, but I thought I'd take a stab at it here just because it comes up so often. And the, the short answer is that the features you need very much depend on what kind of operating you want to do. A casual operator doesn't need much in the way of fancy features and add-ons and may not even be prepared to deal with them and can get in trouble by having a control that gets moved to the wrong place and all of a sudden he can't do anything with his radio. Yes. Um, that happens more often than we... Oh, like I've, I've seen it. Not to me, but I... Of course not to one. us. Oh, of course not, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But a serious contest or DX operator will likely need all the available features and, and perhaps more. But the thing that's important to keep in mind that as you're starting out, you may have an idea of what kind of operating you plan to do, which will drive you towards some particular kind of equipment. But one of the delights of amateur radio is that over time, your interests and primary activities can change rapidly from into different kind of things. You may decide to get interested in contesting or, or chasing DX, um, and that may make some features that you didn't think you would want more important. So it's good to, to not be too restrictive in selecting equipment based on what you think your interests are going to be. And I guess the first consideration in my mind is to um, think about what bands and modes you're going to want to operate. And that's not too big an issue because most current transceivers can operate on all bands from 160 to 6 meters. That's HF transceivers. Yes. And, of course, 160 and 6 meters are not really HF, but they're included right, these right. days. But earlier models uh, may just cover HF and not cover 160 and 6 meters. And uh, earlier ones also probably don't cover the 60-meter channels because those weren't available until fairly recently. That's right. And then you go back another generation. Transceivers made before the 1980s won't likely include provision for 30, 17, and 12 meters. So if you buy a transceiver, you want to make sure you get the bands you're going to want to operate and the modes. I mean, there are some that just do CW and there is some very old gear that just does AM Yes. Which is fine if that's your only interest, but you're never going to be able to go very far beyond that with that tra that piece of equipment. Now, giving up 160 and 6 meters may not be a limitation for some newcomers, principally because a lot of people don't operate 160 anyway because they take usually big antennas or complicated True. antennas. And uh, also, 6 meters is in the VHF area, and many people that, that do operate on VHF have a separate 
set of equipment for that. So you don't lose a lot by giving up 160 and 6 meters, I wouldn't say. But with current propagation conditions, 17 meters has been a very popular band for long-distance work. It's kind of taken the place in a way of 15 meters, in my opinion. Uh, many times yeah, 15 I meters is, so. is not yeah. open, but 17 meters is because it's a lower frequency. Um, and I, I think it's almost the most important DX band after 20 meters, which still is the most popular. But but 17 meters is getting right up there. Yes. Now, I'd be reluctant to give that up since I often chase DX. The next criterion, I would think, is the power level. And most current transceivers put out 100 watts PEP. And I personally would recommend that for a beginner. You can buy less expensive equipment that is very low power, and oftentimes you can use the receiver very well. But the problem is running low power is a challenge for a new operator, particularly who's not experienced, and usually takes some pretty good antennas to have successful operations low power. Yes. So to start out with, you know, get a 100-watt radio, and if you really want to run low power, you can turn the power down. But if you get a low-power radio, you can't turn the then power up. Then you're stuck. <laughs> you're stuck. You're stuck at 5 watts or whatever it is. And that's that's a that's a fun part of the hobby, but, you know, it's, it's not the mainstream part of the hobby that you probably want to get involved in. So that's the next kind of thing. Now, one thing that depends very much on your antenna systems, which, of course, will change over time, if for no other reason because they tend to fall down and need to be put yes. back up, and that is uh, you may or may not need an antenna tuner to make your antennas work on some band. Some transceivers have antenna tuners built in, and... Uh, but you can always get an antenna tuner that goes outside your radio. And many of those are actually more flexible. Yes. So uh, you might want to consider that. Many, but not all of the ones built into transceivers, if my memory is correct, have a range up to roughly a 3 to 1 SWR, and that's, that's it. That's correct. Yeah. And whereas most external tuners, but not all, typically go up to 10 to 1, and that'll get you a lot more coverage on a particular antenna. Yes. And, uh, you know, my system needs a 10 to 1 SWR on some bands because just the way it worked out. So, uh Keep that in mind. And if you do have an internal antenna tuner that does 3 to 1, uh, it may not help you a lot because uh, typically the typical radio will work into an SWR of 2 to 1 without a tuner. So you've got that little narrow difference between 2 to 1 and 3 to 1 that the tuner can help you with. And uh, there are occasions, you know, working a 20-meter a Yagi that uh, is tuned for the CW end and it, you want to use it on the phone end, it might be 3 to 1. It'll work better with the internal tuner than without it. But there are not as many things that you can do with that 3 to 1 tuner. The other thing you need is bandwidth filtering. And uh, modern transceivers tend to have digital signal processing for bandwidth filtering. So you can have just crank in whatever bandwidth you want for whatever mode. So you want a, a 2 kilohertz bandwidth for a single side band or 3 kilohertz if it's a very... There isn't much interference around, and you may want 500 hertz for CW or 200 hertz, depending, um, and similarly for data modes. Older equipment tended to require separate optional filters to get that those bandwidth choices. That's true, yeah. And if you get an older transceiver that doesn't have those filters in it, you may have problems finding a filter that will go in there. Yeah, these days that's true, yeah. So something to keep in mind. Now, you can, if you have a single sideband filter... You can operate CW and you can operate data modes with that. But if the band's busy and you have a lot of uh, signals in the uh, same frequency range that you're trying to listen to, you will wish you had a narrower filter capability. You'll wish it very quickly. Yeah, yes. I think that's true. Now, again, that can be done outside the radio also, but it doesn't seem to work quite as well. No. Now, there are definitely features you don't need as you start out. And the two that come to my mind are two that I actually find very useful, but I must say for many years I didn't have either and still had a fine time um, playing radio. One is a second receiver. I like to listen to two different frequencies, one in each ear when I'm operating. That would drive me crazy, frankly, yeah. but I, I'm glad you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not for everybody. For one thing, a lot of people don't have two functional ears. So it's a complete waste of, of time in a way. But if you're listening to split frequency operation and you have the, the frequency you're calling on on one ear and the frequency of the DX station on the other, it's very easy to keep track of what's going on as long as you remember which ear is which. <laughs> yes. Which is, <laughs> that's a little bit of a, a skill, I guess. I haven't found it that hard to do. And it even works with uh, speakers if they're far enough apart. But But you definitely don't need that starting out. Because most transceivers allow you to switch frequencies back and forth between two VFOs very quickly. And that can functionally very similar. The other thing is a spectrum scope. Ah, yes. 
And that, that's very handy. You got to look at the whole band or a section of the band at a time and you can see where the activity is and something pops up. You can go see what that is. And that's handy. But, you know, for many years, we survived just tuning the knob sure. back and forth and, <laughs> and listening as we went. And those two last things, the second receiver and the spectrum scope, take the price of a transceiver up significantly. So by um, by not doing those, you probably can save a lot of money on your first transceiver. Okay, very good. Thank you, Joel. My pleasure. If you have a question for the doctor, email us at doctor at ARRL.org. The Doctor is In podcast is sponsored by DX Engineering at www.dxengineering.com. Background music provided by Purple Planet at www.purple-planet.com. This podcast is copyright ARRL. All rights are reserved. Until next time, I'm QST Managing Editor Becky Schoenfeld, W1BXY73, and thanks for listening. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.p0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70MHzShop.nl. 70MHzShop.nl Whoever hears this is crazy. En microfoon naar retour.